the truth. Nothing but truth. On AFR Talk. Let's get cut 20 ready. I don't want to hear from Kathleen Sebelius right now. Crane Durham's Nothing But Truth proudly on AFR Talk. And now we go to our guest, good friend, Pete Sepp. He's the Executive Vice President of the National Taxpayers Union and a regular guest right here on Crane Durham's Nothing But Truth. Blessed to have him. And Pete, I want to talk about unions because I know at the National Taxpayers Union, you're not a bunch of thugs. But this man's a thug. And I'm saying that Crane Durham. I'm talking about Richard Trumka and his past. I say that because I think when people don't go back and, and at least admit and show some contrition for what has happened in the wake of their movement in the past, the violence that has taken place, would be it with Reverend Sharpton or others, I think we do a disservice to justice and the people that suffered and the idea of union intimidation that we have seen most recently play out, most visibly, I would say, in the case of Wisconsin. But I digress. Pete Sepp, I'm going to play for you the AFL-CIO president, Richard Trumka, and his thoughts on Obamacare. As you know, he was a big supporter of it. It's cut 20. That's why I said I wanted to go to cut 20. All right, let's roll it. The Affordable Care Act does need some modifications to it uh, because as it does right now, what, what's happening is you have employers that, that the law says if you pay your, if your employees work 30 hours or more a week, you got to give them health care. So they're restructuring their workforce to give workers 29 and a half hours so they don't have to provide them health care. Now, that's really peculiar coming from a man who talked about how great it was, Obamacare was, and he got an exemption. So he's talking about a law that, well, applies to us, but not to him, but he's advocating it for all. And uh, he carved out some exemptions for the union. Pete, your thoughts? Well, very clearly, the unions overreached when deciding to back Obamacare in 2010. There is, of course, that Cadillac benefits tax that might very well affect unionized workers and certain health insurance plans, but that's not kicking in for a while. There are former union workers who are now retired taking the medical expense deduction on their tax returns. Well, that's going to be a lot harder to take because the threshold of medical expenses you have to prove as a percent of your income is going to go up thanks to Obamacare. That's going to hit retirees a couple of years down the road. It's hitting non-retired Americans who take that deduction now. So these are all things that they could have seen coming if they'd read the law right after it passed, even before it passed. But of course, Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi said we had to pass the thing to find out what was in it. But uh, the day after it passed, it would have been pretty evident that those <laughs> things would affect union workers. And unfortunately, though, you're right. Most of the provisions that are hitting us right now still don't touch unionized workers. Right. They certainly don't touch union leaders. And uh, now Richard Trumka is saying, well, employers are dodging this. I wonder what his solution is. Just make the mandate universal no matter how many hours you work, maybe five hours a week. The employer still has to provide insurance, unless, of course, we're talking about employees of unions. <laughs> it just goes on and on. And and I also want to make it clear, I'm not, when I speak to the criticism of Richard Trumka and the leadership of the unions, I'm not speaking to the individual rank and file union members, 40,000 of which have left the unions. One of the reason uh, left the union, one of the reasons being Obamacare cited. So, Pete, this is a this is frustrating because what we're dealing with is a government that is selectively enforcing the law and has said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pass it. We don't know what's in it, but we do know this in the 2,000 plus pages. We're going to take some. We're going to we're going to cover as much as we can. Grab as much power as we can. And then what we're going to do is we're going to carve that back that power for our friends. That doesn't yeah. sound like a recipe for, well, it doesn't sound congruous with the Constitution, Pete, at all. No, no, it doesn't. And it's important to remember that when we talk about unionization trends in this country, the single biggest 
trend has been the reduction of members in the private sector belonging to unions and the increase of members in the public sector belonging to unions. You have federal employees, many of whom are unionized. A lot of teachers are unionized. A lot of state and local employees are unionized. And their health care plans are not necessarily being as hard hit as those in the private sector. There might be some who are being employed by uh, state universities, for example. A fair number of instructors are seeing their hours cut back so the universities can avoid uh, having to provide that health insurance coverage. But then again, there are more carve-outs for public unionized employees, government employees, than there are for the rest of us. And how this impacts people that are sitting there going, Crane, you, you talk about Obamacare a lot, the Affordable Care Act a lot, and you, you talk about the policy and the impact it has. Well, understand, people are paying these bills, and you may not be hit by it right now, but you're going to be. And you, looking at the law, even with the exemptions of five years, whatever it may be, you're going to be, or your kids are going to be. And meanwhile, do you know somebody who's out of work right now? I do. Yeah. Maybe somebody in your family. Maybe you are. Well, one of the things that is causing that is the tremendous uncertainty as well as the cost of labor being driven up by the Affordable Care Act. Pete, it's, it's something that uh, I know that the proponents of this want to turn it into, you don't like President Obama. Well, I really don't know the man. All I speak to is his record, okay? And he may play, you know, we may go up on the basketball court or whatever it may be, and, and, and he'll, you know, we'll get along. He probably wouldn't play basketball with me because I'm just not that good. But bottom line, maybe it's another sport. Maybe we'll go for a jog. My point is this. It's not about President Obama. It's not about the man's race. It's not about anything along those lines. It's about you me and the rest of America that has to deal with the consequences of this action. And, Pete, I think you deal with this a lot because you can deal with the numbers and you could take down Krugman in a, in a nanosecond. But when it gets to the emotion, sometimes the left wins these debates not by fighting them with the substance but by accusing and, and, and engaging in character assassination of their opponent. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, my organization has something called Bill Tally. It's a legislative tracking system that assigns costs to various proposals that have been introduced in Congress. We've been doing this since 1991. I can tell you that many of these health care so-called reform concepts have been around for a long time before Barack Obama ever really got into politics, single payer systems sort of the framework of exchanges, certain tax proposals, such as cutting back on the medical expense deduction. These things predated Barack Obama's ascendancy to the White House. They were rotten ideas before he latched onto them, before he made it the signature achievement of his administration. And so what we are stuck with is an amalgamation of proposals that have long been simmering on the stove here in Washington, D.C. They're all starting to boil over now with very disastrous effects for our economy. And it is interesting, not about R's or D's, but about accountability. And the NTU, National Taxpayers Union, NTU.org, check out their website because this is the way that we're brought up to speed. You want resources, this is another resource that you have and that Pete and his organization provides. Question, Pete. When things are going so bad, I, I, I look at this almost as Orwellian, but it's, it's not. I, I see a study has said that the Fed's QE program, quantitative easing, U.S. employment, without it, U.S. unemployment would have hit 18%. Now, th this to me is, is also like telling me that Obamacare is doing wonders for the economy. It's creating jobs, or green energy is doing the same thing. It's, it's telling me something uh, that is at odds with the record. Your thoughts on this recent study out of UCLA's economist Roger Farmer? Well, there's the old saying, put two economists together in a white room. One will say the walls are black. The other will say they're blue. 
and uh, that's that's a problem. But I, I think this UCLA study is one take on the effect of QE. But here's another take. This is the San Francisco Federal Reserve. I have to give a hat tip to Robert Romano of Americans for Limited Government who found this. And it turns out that the second part of quantitative easing, QE2, added 0.13 percentage points to real gross domestic product growth in late 2010 and 0.03 of a percentage to inflation. Now, that doesn't seem to equate with a dramatic reduction in unemployment. After all, there is a relationship between a growing economy and a growing job market. QE2 did not seem to have that kind of impact. What it did have was a tremendous impact in buying up bad mortgage-backed securities, a result of the housing bubble that arguably the Fed and other Washington government-based policies helped to cause. Plus, the QE2 is also buying up well over a trillion dollars worth of U.S. government debt. So those are consequences that we're going to have to deal with a long way down the road. We have to remember, too, China's economy is slowing down, may not be able to absorb some of our national debt the way it has been in buying up those securities. What's going to happen when all of this quantitative easing has to wind down? Who's going to start buying U.S. debt securities? How are we going to resolve still some of the bad mortgage debt that's out there? These are questions that uh, federal officials and Federal Reserve officials don't seem to have an answer for. Pete, this also, I mean, in that what you just said, I can draw out the fact that this is going to act as a tax because we will see inflation, will we not, through this? Yes. Yes, and of course, we'll, we'll end up getting into this horrible spectacle whereby if inflation starts to rise and interest rates start to rise, the amount of money the federal government itself will have to pay to finance the national debt will start to rise, and that might require more borrowing. I mean, when you get into a situation where you have to borrow more money to service your existing debt, you know you're in trouble. Yeah, it's not kitchen table economics because our kitchen tables don't have a money tree in the middle of them that can print. Pete Sepp, even with that detailed analysis, I will say this. You've given us something positive because you're pointing out the problem and you provide solutions, ntu.org. Great to be with you, my friend. Thank you. Same here. Take care. Take care. Crane Durham's nothing but truth. Say a prayer for Jim Hoff, the Gateway Pundit, and we'll see you next time. AFR Talk.